Have you ever thought about this? What is biological anthropology? Biological anthropology is the study of biological and behavior aspects of human beings, extend hominid ancestors and related non-human primates from an evolutionary perspective. Many interesting questions link to the study of anthropology, from questioning the existence of our post societies like Wakanda in the Black Panther film, to how we have diverged into humans from our common ancestor with the chimpanzee. In this video, we will take an exploratory journey in the field of biological and anthropology and human civilization from the film Black Panther. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Michael Rivera, a biological and anthropologist from the University of Hong Kong, to discuss these topics with us. Dr. Michael is a leading Filipino Chinese biological anthropologist, and today um, Dr. Michael and I are going to talk about language, culture, and art, and how these ideas relate to biological anthropology in human civilization and the develop the development of human history. So, Dr. Michael, let's start with a warm-up question. So, I'm very curious, like, why you started your profession in this field? My interest in anthropology started when I was a teenager, roughly around 13 or 14 years old, and I would watch a lot of TV shows or uh, read a lot of books about science, and then I found out that there was a field called anthropology. So when I was maybe 16 or 17, I started to apply for university, and I remember um, flipping through the program of uh, all, the, all the courses you can take at university. And I remember seeing uh, accounting, no, <laughs> um, and then I saw anthropology and archaeology, and then I, I really liked it because it seemed to be a very interesting field that merges together um, the study of science, the study of language, the study of history, of the environment, and everything about humans. So uh, I myself have a lot of interests and anthropology seemed to be the course I would encapsulate it because it's the study of all humankind. Yeah, yeah I see. That's fascinating. And I'm also very interested in like the role of art, language, and culture and how these relate to human civilization because I'm a student of your um, CC class and we've talked about like rock and cave art um, and how um, art and culture developed in say like humans closest mm -hmm. relative Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested in like if you can let us know about some examples about um, art, language and culture that relates to your studies. Sure. Um... So I specialize in researching how people live on the coast mm -hmm. or on the beach or um, on the seaside environments. And so I um, go at this at, by, uh, through different angles. I will first look at biological differences between people who live on the coast and people who don't. And is there something about people who live in marine environments that makes them special biologically? Um, and then after looking at the human skeletons and looking at things biologically, I'll consider also the artifacts, the archaeology, the culture um, that, they, that we have evidence on. Um, we actually have in Hong Kong an archaeology record that stretches back about 7,000 years. And so you mentioned rock art. Not a lot of people in Hong Kong or around the world know that in Hong Kong we actually have several rock art sites. Um, and they date back to about 3,000 or 4,000 years ago and they are found around the islands of Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong has many islands um, and so I love going to visit them and to take a look at them because they look quite special. Um, have you ever been to those or have you heard of those before? Yes, I remember last year my friend and I went to Tong Long Chou oh, yes. and there's a like, there's a high stairs. You can like walk down to the cliff near the sea and there is supposed to be some like that, that kind of primitive symbols cave mm -hmm. carved like on the rocks. Yeah. And I read um, the introduction there and it also introduced that there are like about nine or ten mm -hmm. um, these like um, like cultural heritage sites in Hong Kong regarding rock art. Yeah. So that's how I got interested in this the examples. So like if we want to think from a broader, say a general perspective, 
So as a biological anthropologist, mm -hmm. what are the like simple ways of studying, say, language, art, and culture? Mm -hmm. So as a biological anthropologist, I particularly am very interested in the human anatomy and also human genetics. So what are some of the biological traits that humans have that have um, been advantage, uh, mm -hmm. been advantageous for us and our species? So that's why we see how we behave and how we look today. Um, one of those key ones would be language, and we actually find a lot of evidence in the um, skeletal record when we look at the human bones and teeth um, of language adaptation. So one of those things would be, for example, your hyoid bone, which is a, a bone that sits around your neck and your throat over here, and it's kind of uh, U-shaped. And it's U-shaped in particular so that it's nice and broad and your vocal cords can um, stretch and attach to them. Um, and what we see is that through this um, evolution through time, um, it's adapted that way so that we have more control over our vocalization. We're able to shout and we're able to whisper and we're able to um, change our tone and change our volume in ways that we need at different times in life. Um, we even look at the genetic evidence that we have too, and we find that not only humans, but Neanderthals, mm -hmm. our closest ancestors in the past, have also the ability to speak, because there are certain genes that we have in our code that allow us um, to develop parts of the brain that are useful for memory, for communication. Mm -hmm. So those would be all located in the frontal part of the brain, around mm -hmm. your frontal cortex. So we find those genes, that code for those parts of the brain mm -hmm. um, in the end. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I also feel that sometimes I can appreciate, say, a foreign music, some foreign music, even if I don't understand their language, I can right. still empathize with them. Yeah, and I think that like art is a very good way to see like what we have in common, how we share our civilization together. And I think that this ability of empathy rather than sympathy yeah. is also part of like our responsibility of being humane mm -hmm. and to be civilized you have and you have an eye to appreciate others say culture or art because um at the end of the day we're all humans so there shouldn't be like such political divides or say um discrimination that separate us i really love uh, looking at different artistic modes of expression from different societies in the past and even today. Um, even just appreciating um, dance, different dance uh, music, um, comic books, games, or even forms of art, TV shows and movies, of course. And I, I think that, um, you know, whether it's rock art or paintings or music, they're all expressions of those beliefs. And um, they're, all, they're all modes of communication. And so I think about communication all the time and, and why it's important to appreciate it when others make the effort to put that into art. Because you're really um, using something physical or material to, to put your heart and your own mind into uh, a piece of work. And so in that piece of work, from that moment onwards, for always, has a symbolic meaning. That's why things like rock art um, can leave such an impression because it's that cultural uh, transfer that has happened through the medium to another person. And um, yeah, I, I also think art is really um, a key, key thing. It's a key phenomenon in the human experience. Yeah. yeah. So I feel that like language is something like they in at a specific at a specific time in a specific community. So they communicate with each other using that specific language. Mm -hmm. Whereas like art and say culture might be something that um, can be passed on from generation to generation, from a country to say another continent. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's also like through time. So like when I appreciate the rock in the cave art, for example, the swimmer in the uh, in the cave, that piece of work, I really feel that kind of spirituality and people's hope mm -hmm. for uh, say a better life, a fruitful life or harvest. Yeah, so I really feel that there's something that that is like say, transcendental mm. that really unites us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I also feel the same. The next topic. I've got a friend who's a big fan of Black Panther. Oh, and me I, too. <laughs> yeah, I know you love the film as well. Mm -hmm. Um, rather more about like how you find the film. 
so uh, I am a very nerdy kid, and I, I like a lot of uh, different media. Those would include, you know, Disney films and um, Pokemon. Uh, I still play Pokemon Go on my phone, um, and I really, really love all the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, movies and TV shows now. And one of the very um, one of the films that really changed my perspective on on life and the world and was a really impressive film was Black Panther. Um, it came out in 2018 and it was a film, uh, the first one in the franchise that would feature main characters, majority of them were not white. They were actually on purpose Africans or African Americans. And I found it really important because of the representation that it had in the film. And the storylines that they would have in the film were really, mm -hmm. um, I could talk about them all day, but I'm yeah. curious, what, what are you most interested in hearing about? Uh, yeah, so I'm interested in hearing about like the society Wakanda, mm. and if there are, say, leftover uh, or like unbound societies like Wakanda today, oh, um, okay. if so, like what will their, say, cultural, technological, spiritual mm. traits be? I think that it's unlikely that there would be you know tribes or communities that we haven't met yet i think that um you know unfortunately i think that a lot of um, you know national governments have already explored much of the land that we have on earth and um, at least have documented and made a record of who lives where yes. everywhere but i do think that there is variation in how much um, different groups uh, will be exposed, I guess, or have interactions with, um, you know, outside communities, communities outside their own. Um, I think that, you know, it's interesting to consider uh, Wakanda in the film Black Panther and the franchise because I think it's a metaphor, basically. It's a, it's the idea that you know, in the first part of the movie, they are struggling with the main character struggling with whether they should open up their borders and let everybody know that they exist yeah. um, and so I think it's a really interesting thing this theme of you know should should people protect themselves or should we actually unite um, they're hesitant because of the way that the world has treated Africans after um, colonial yeah, times like over several, several hundred years so um, I think that those are really like contemporary debates that everybody mm -hmm. has about you know, um, the way that we relate to each other. Yeah, I think so. Um, versus how much we should protect ourselves mm -hmm. in a way because of um, globalization presenting a lot of challenges to each society. You know? yeah. And I do think that, you know, sometimes science can be very, um, honestly, some, some, sometimes scientists can be very arrogant right. in thinking that they have all the answers mm -hmm. to how the universe runs and yeah. how it's meaningful. But I do think that there are some concepts like um, abstract concepts like love mm -hmm. yeah. or belief mm -hmm. where scientists are still working it out. Yeah. Um, and as much as we try to find the answers in our genes, mm -hmm. in our brain structures, mm -hmm. in our hormones, mm -hmm. it doesn't explain, <laughs> it doesn't really fully explain experiences wow. such as love or hope or yeah. despair. There is something I think spiritual about that, something mm -hmm. metaphysical about that, that at least I make room for questions. Yeah. And I think that is what a healthy science is, like mm -hmm. good robust science shouldn't, should realize the limitations, answer the questions that they can. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really appreciate your perspective too, since you've been in, in my course, <laughs> that you shared with me from the beginning that, you know, spirituality, mm -hmm. um, abstract concepts like these, these are really some of the things that anthropologists perhaps don't have all the answers to just yet and more people should in the field explore. I'm very curious like for you anthropological anthropologist how do you see the view of see the role of being humane mm -hmm. um, how that plays in say scientific research or the research on more like humanity subjects yeah I think that um, definitely these days um, if you're talking about politics or religion mm -hmm. yes. um, culture, there are many things that I think on the surface people will respond to in a way that is a little bit um, out of fear or out of insecurity. Um, maybe there's a lack of uh, 
um, education, about certain other people's experiences. Um, they don't understand why anyone else would act in a way that is different from them. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's also a lack of empathy. So mm -hmm. if you don't understand how someone's acting, then you can't really step in their shoes and know everybody else's uh, motivations, mm -hmm. what are their challenges, what do they hope for, is there any common ground? Because in the beginning, you've already shut yourself off, perhaps. And what I do hope that in, in my research, um, the research that others do in anthropology, what we're actually trying to do is identify why we have a common thread of evolution yeah. that links all of us together. We have a very common heritage and history that we can date back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, there are things that unite us in the way that we have certain evolutionary traits mm -hmm. that make us all the same. Essentially, we may not, we may not, we may not look the same. So, for example, the fact that we all have um, degrees of melanin in our skin mm -hmm. that allow us to tan, mm -hmm. and certain others are adapted to higher altitude, uh, sorry, higher latitudes, and others to lower latitudes. That's why we have different skin color. It's not a reason to divide us. It's actually we all have the same adaptive evolutionary processes acting on us. So shouldn't we see that as a thing that holds us all together, that connects us all? Um, another good example would be, why is it that people seem to divide um, across political or religious lines? And um, it's because people believe very hard in what they're doing is right, or what they're yes. saying is right. Yeah. But you see, the ability to believe mm -hmm. is also in itself an adaptation. Mm -hmm. It's something that all homo sapiens have evolved so that we can draw community with one another. Those who, um, in the past, culturally, who perhaps didn't have as many strong beliefs, mm -hmm. didn't have group identity, mm -hmm. perhaps were more alone in society, and then those cultural traits wouldn't be passed on uh, to the next generation yes. who, um, so, so over those generations, the ability to come together under a united belief mm -hmm. becomes stronger and stronger. So if we think of it that way, again, it's not no reason to believe that people should divide. We all have the same instincts. Mm -hmm. We all want the best for ourselves and our families and our societies. Um, I do think that maybe these are sorts of the evolutionary um, uh, understandings that are quite important for us to enter the next phase of this century and uh, really tackle some big issues we can only do that together we can we have that basis we have that ability in our species to do that mm -hmm. so yeah those are my perspectives human evolution led to the development of modern art language and culture the production and usage of tools are important developments enhanced by evolution human ancestors began to use the stone tools approximately 3.3 million years ago Soon, bronze tools were developed, and around 1200 BC, iron tools were used. Machines were soon developed after the Industrial Revolution. There is a correlation found between the development of tools and the increase of cranial capacity throughout human evolution. The size and complexity of brains throughout the evolutionary timeline from the earliest primates to the modern human have increased. Larger and more complex brains were assumed to be developed under the pressure of new environmental challenges throughout time. Where larger and more complex brains allowed species to process and store more information, making it an advantageous trait to pass on to the next generations. In our interview with Dr. Michael, we discussed how humans develop various forms of art. Early humans in various parts of the world created rock and cave art. These developments were correlated with the evolution of creation and the use of tools. Nowadays, we have modern forms of art such as tempera, oil painting, and car engraving, and digital film created by varieties of tools. Anthropologists like Dr. Michael work on the study of biological anthropology, deepening our insights into human evolution and human civilization. Biological anthropology connects the past, present, and future of human beings and reveals the spectacular wonder of human beings. Until today, there are still many unknown fields about the human evolution and human civilization. We sincerely hope that more people will have some exposure to biological anthropology and even delve into this field.